Hello, everyone. We are live. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from whatever part of the world you call home. Um, I am joined today uh, by with Megan Creeden from uh, Tuck Admissions. And today we're going to go through a live uh, Q&A session answering both your questions. Uh, Megan also has several questions uh, kind of that she's heard over either over the years or even just some updates from the Tuck side uh, that we'll get to today. We're excited uh, for everyone being here. And please feel free if you have any questions at all, uh, ask them in the YouTube chat, the Facebook chat, whatever chat you're using. We also have Alina that uh, from Tuck as well, who's going to be in the background answering some of your questions online. Uh, but without further ado, um, introduction to myself. Uh, my name is Brendan Kelly. I am a uh, moderator for GMAT Club and then a, a, an actual future Tucky. I was uh, admitted to Tuck uh, round one and have been uh, kind of building up that excitement ever since. So this is a really great opportunity to uh, chat with Megan uh, and maybe even ask some questions of my own uh, should we get there. But uh, excited to have you, Megan, and I'll let you uh, take the ball. Yeah, thanks, Brendan, and uh, thanks for being here with me. It's awesome to have a, a future Tucky on the line. Um, hi, everyone. As Brendan mentioned, my name is Megan Creedon, and I am the assistant director for YIELD at the Tuck School, so I'm a member of the admissions committee. Um, I also have the great privilege of working closely with our Tuck ambassadors, which at Tuck is just about every student, so um, Brendan will see a lot of me next year. Um, but I'm thrilled to be with you today. I want to use the majority of our time to get kind of right to the questions that are on your mind at, at different kind of stages in the application process right now. Um, I acknowledge that folks may be at really different places. Um, some of you may be planning to submit applications in round four um, or next cycle. Others may still remain on the wait list at Tuck, and still others may have received the news that they were not admitted to Tuck this year, but are eager to reapply in the fall. Um, so at the outset, I'd like to share just a few opening words that may be helpful in framing our conversation. Um, for those in the early stages of looking at tech or planning on apl an application in round four, welcome. I'm super excited you're with us and hope we'll cross paths at future events as you prepare your application and assess your fit with tech. At Tuck, our mission is to develop wise, decisive leaders who better the world through business, and we achieve this by offering a uniquely personal, connected, and transformative MBA experience. Um, I'm happy to talk in more depth about the general management framework of the curriculum, our scale, we're among the smallest of top MBA programs, our location in the small town of Hanover, New Hampshire, or our focus on the MBA. Um, we only have the two-year full-time MBA at Tuck, um, which means everyone at Tuck is oriented around your experience from career services to the faculty to kind of the folks sitting in class right alongside with you. Um, we can also chat in greater depth about the application process, at the heart of which are four guiding criteria, smart, aware, accomplished, and encouraging. Um, we look for these criteria across the different components of your application and recognize that no two candidates are alike. Different people shine for different reasons, and, and that's kind of what we look for here at Tech. Um, in addition to all that we'll cover today about the admissions process, um, I would also love to see you at future events with Tuck. Um, I'd love for you to connect with our Tuck ambassadors, the students I mentioned, um, and also read the Tuck 360 blog. It's a phenomenal resource for anyone at any stage in the application process. Um, turning towards those that currently remain on the wait list at Tuck, as we near round three decision release on May 6th, I know that the anxiety can be high. My biggest tip for you all is to take a deep breath and trust the process. Um, I know it's a bit of a waiting game, but Tuck's commitment to maintaining a small class size means we have to make difficult admissions decisions within a competitive pool of applicants, including having to waitlist some compelling folks. Um, an offer for a slot on Tuck's waitlist is a positive indicator of your alignment with our four admissions criteria, um, so take that as a great sign and the overall competitiveness of your application. There are definitely some things you can do to set yourself up for success while on the waitlist. First and foremost, respond promptly to any emails or communications from us that you get regarding your waitlist status. We may ask you multiple times to continue to opt in as we consider candidates across rounds and even into the summer months. Similarly, if you received actionable feedback from us, to take that feedback um, under advisement and act on it to the best of your abil ability. Um, beyond our feedback, you can also do some reflection on your application and how you demonstrated strengths across our four admissions criteria. Check in with yourself and assess whether there is anything you've done since submitting your application that bolsters your strengths or addresses any of your self-perceived areas for improvement. Um, I'll add, though, don't be too hard on yourself. Some of those areas for improvement that you see, um, we might not even be looking at as weaknesses, so have confidence in your own abilities there. Um, if you have new information to share with us, similarly keep us updated, whether it's a new test score, a promotion, um, a new work opportunity, contact information changes, or other substantive updates, let us know. That's really helpful. Um, in terms of timing, the admissions committee will re-review your candidacy in anticipation of round three, um, which May 6th is our decision release date for round three. Um, at the end of which you may be offered admission, your waitlist status may be extended, 
or you may be released and encouraged to reapply next year. Offers of admission to waitlisted candidates may also be extended on a rolling basis as late as August. As we get into the summer months, con consider what steps you would need to take to matriculate at Tech and leave your employer in good standing should you receive an offer of admission in late summer, especially given there's often a quick turnaround time with those waitlist offers later in the summer. Um, and finally, a word to those who ultimately were not admitted to Tech this cycle, but remain enthusiastic about improving their candidacy next cycle. Um, first, I understand your disappointment, and due to our small size, we must make difficult admissions decisions each round and cannot admit all of the qualified candidates who applied. The good news is, please know that we view reapplications to Tech very positively. Um, one of my colleagues once said, there are many paths to Tech, you just have to find yours, and I think that's exactly right. Um, each year, the Tech class includes reapplicants who did the hard work of additional introspection and strengthening their application. True to our ethos of clarity and accessibility in the admissions process, we offer the opportunity to receive feedback on your application from a member of the admissions team. Um, as a reapplicant, you'll have the opportunity to share new information and rewrite essays, provide new recommendations, and do some renewed introspection about your goals and career interests. We'll also ask you to specifically address in a fourth essay your personal and professional growth since your last application and how you've strengthened your candidacy. Um, wherever you're at in the application, know that myself and my colleagues on the admissions team are here to help. Um, that is one of the reasons I joined the Tech Admissions team. Um, this is how accessible we get to be to you all. So really take advantage of that um, through events like this, the GMAT Club, through events with Tech specifically, um, through those online forums, through um, our Tech 360 blog. There's so many different ways to connect with us. Um, so with that, you've heard from me long enough at the outset here. So <laughs> I'll turn it back over to Brendan and we can go ahead and just kind of dive right into those questions that you all have. Sure. And, and I mean, just, of course, kind of reiterating some of the points that you've made as, as someone who has just recently gone through the process. I really do want to first, I want to say that this is, of course, going to be posted to YouTube. So if you want to go re-listen to that opening part uh, and, and rehear some of those topics, I definitely encourage you to do so. Uh, that being said, what Megan said about reaching out to Tuckies, both um, on the administrative side, the student side, the alumni side, is uh, is really true. Um, I went through uh, the applications for several, several schools, and there was not a single school that was as communicative as Tuck was. Um, every person I called was was there ready to talk and not only just ready to talk and answer your questions, but actually wanted to. Um, and, and it was that kind of passion that that is the reason that I'll be there in, in a couple months. Um, and, and yeah, so we'll go ahead and uh, go into some of these questions. And I have uh, seen a couple people posting in the chat as well. Um, and the first question, I had it right up here is someone saying that they uh, got waitlisted in round two. They submitted their waitlist feedback, but have not been invited for an interview yet. Are you still sending invitations uh, for waitlisted candidates? Yeah, so we'll continue to expend, extend interview invitations kind of throughout the summer as needed. Again, you know, we're considering folks for this kind of upcoming round three, um, but we'll also continue to do so on a rolling basis throughout the summer. So really you could hear from us kind of at any point to schedule that interview. Um, I remember last summer um, with many of our TAAs, our, our kind of second year admissions associates heading off into the world um, for their post pack life. Um, I know I was conducting a, a good number of interviews last summer for waitlisted folks and round four applicants. So that process very much continues. Um, an interview is required um, to be admitted to Tuck. We think it's a really important part of kind of getting to know you and your story. Um, so those invitations are ongoing. Um, if you already had your interview with us, that's great. Um, we have that information and we'll kind of continue to use that as we're making informed admissions decisions. So, um, you know, you don't need to reach out to us to request um, an interview. Again, it's kind of at the invitation of the admissions committee here at Tuck, um, but that is very much an ongoing process into the summer months. Hmm. Fantastic. And then uh, there's there is a lot of a lot of issues going around with, of course, the uh, the current climate of uh, health and safety. And I know Tuck has been very communicative on that kind of their approach to making sure that everybody comes, uh, everybody that's there is uh, there in a safe capacity and we're following specific guidelines. Uh, so there is there is a question regarding that. Um, and it's with with the amount of uh, maybe increase in cases. And we can also talk uh, internationally as well. Um, has Tuck given any relaxation on the GMAT, maybe for uh, well, both this cycle, but then also potentially the next year's cycle? And then how is the school looking at deferrals for the year 2021? Yeah, so we still require the GMAT or the GRE here at Tuck, and we've had no changes to that policy um, across the entirety of this cycle. It's important that our application criteria remains consistent across rounds. Um, of course, we, we empathize with kind of, you know, different situations around the world right now. So I always encourage you um, reach out to Tuck Admissions to kind of chat with us about um, what's going on in your life and, and kind of where you're at in the application process. Reach out to me specifically or, or my colleagues. We're always really happy to 
kind of talk with you and, and help you assess um, when is the right time to apply to Tuck and, and kind of what that looks like. Um, regarding deferrals, so our deferral policy at Tuck is kind of in line with, with any typical year here. Um, we review those on a case by case basis, of course, leading with empathy, um, but also acknowledging that we have a small class size here at Tuck. If we have a large number of deferrals, that has a really meaningful impact on the class that we enroll this year and the class that we enroll next year. Um, so even thinking back to you know, last spring um, this time, we did not offer kind of a blanket deferral policy. And again, that was really intentional, um, kind of guided by that small class size and, and wanting to really enroll great classes this year, um, this past year, our T22s and um, Brendan's class, the T23s. So of course we continue to kind of, um, again, lead with empathy and consider those on a case by case basis. Typically we offer deferrals for kind of exceptional circumstances. So of course, you know, joint degrees and, and kind of requirements um, for deferral there, um, exceptional personal circumstances, um, military deployments, things of that nature. Um, so you can always be in touch as an admitted student with your admissions officer um, who you'll kind of be collaborating closely with and, and they're really happy to help work with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis to understand possibilities for deferral. Um, but again, no meaningful change or, or departure to our policies there. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And and maybe a maybe a relatively quick question that I that I think I know the answer to, but I'll throw it up in case anyone is curious. Um, how soon or at what point should do you recommend submitting a waitlist update so that the update actually gets considered for round three? Yesterday. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> ASAP. I think as soon as you have an update to share with us, please do send that our way. Um, as I mentioned, May 6th is when we'll release round three decisions. Um, so certainly if you want it to be considered ahead of round three in advance of that date would probably be helpful. Um, but again, we'll continue to consider um, all folks on the wait list up through the summer months. So at any point, if you have a substantive update, you can use kind of the application status tool um, that you have access to to share that update with us. If you have new test scores to share, please send that via email to Tuck Admissions. Um, but definitely let us know sooner rather than later if something in your application has changed so we can be aware of that as we're kind of, you know, making those admission decisions day to day throughout the summer months. Awesome. Great. And then kind of retouching base on the uh, the feedback received for those on the wait list. Um, someone did receive feedback that uh, to provide an additional essay on motivation. Uh, but they're also wondering, should I then give you an update on what they've been doing since applying and maybe maybe kind of stretch this question out more uh, in a broader stroke and just say when you're given feedback, should you only do what that feedback says? Or is that an opportunity to kind of paint a better picture overall in that essay? What is too much? And maybe what is what is uh, what are you looking for? Yeah, so I think first and foremost, address specifically what was asked of you, right? So if you're asked to clarify your goals, it's great to update us on what you've been doing at work since we last heard from you, but specifically get to the heart of what we asked, right? Um, share more with us about your short term and, and long term goals and kind of how the Tuck MBA fits into that just as an example. Um, so I think really important to address the feedback you're given. Um, but to my earlier point, kind of doing your own personal introspection. Um, if there are other places in your application that you think could be strengthened, um, certainly feel free to share additional context with us using that kind of waitlist update um, kind of uh, application in your application portal with Tuck. Um, if you have substantive updates, especially, you do want to let us know about those. So if you have a really kind of um, new or exciting work project, if you have a new test score, if you have um, kind of been brushing up your quantitative skills in different ways, um, let us know about those things. I think that's really key to kind of keep us updated. At the same time, use good judgment and thinking about how often is kind of the right cadence to communicate with us. I think that's a great way to show your awareness. Um, important to kind of, you know, again, respond to our updates, asking you to kind of reaffirm your interest in remaining on the wait list. And on that note, too, I'll say if your plans change and you're you're intending to go elsewhere, um, that's great. We're wishing you the best of luck with your MBA experience. But do let us know um, because it will help us kind of admit folks who really want to be at Tuck and are, are kind of anxiously awaiting decisions from us. Um, so I think, you know, great to keep us updated on those substantive things and kind of those reflections that you've done on your application. Um, but don't feel like you need to send us a waitlist update every week, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, we kind of have all that information and, and we'll kind of continue to revisit it. So you don't have to kind of um, surface the same information for us over and over again. 
Beautiful. No, great answer. And uh, so now maybe going on to a little bit about the experience of Tuck just in general. Um, I know there were a lot of people that potentially deferred admissions last year or were nervous about applying this year because they weren't sure what that landscape was going to look like. I mean, the, a huge plus of the MBA program is the connections you make, the uh, uh, the ability to hang out with your peers and, and really build together. And I think Tuck um, really prides themselves on that relationship building and, and with the alumni network. Uh, so there is there are some questions kind of regarding what that experience looks like. Um, and so this question here is, what are the key differences between on-campus experience and virtual? Uh, they de delayed their MBA plans. Um, and I believe that in, in classroom experience and physical action interaction is important. So maybe on your side, just give an update on, on kind of what Tuck is looking at for the future in terms of uh, in, -person, in person versus virtual. Yeah, so I think a couple of things there, um, kind of looking towards the future, I think we also have to look back at this past year a little bit too, right? So, you know, kind of virtual experience, I don't think truly kind of um, conveys what, what the Tuck experience was like for our T22s this year. So at Tuck this past year, we've kind of been in a, a hybrid mode. So folks have been in the classroom kind of learning alongside peers, like many things at Tuck, it was kind of a, a student co-created experience. So um, students built this great kind of methodology for assigning class seats for in camp on campus classes. Um, so folks were opting into those and kind of increasingly more so in the spring, which is really exciting. Um, we've also been able to kind of keep some of those um, personal connections alive and well at Tuck, you know, certainly through virtual events, but also through um, creative work from students in the MBA program office about how we safely convene um, and kind of be together during these times. Um, you know, I think about some of my favorite Tuck events like um, Tuck Talks, um, even Admitted Students Weekend, which Brendan, I, I think you were there with us. Yes. Um, you know, we were able to offer those in kind of new and exciting ways um, that I think did get to kind of some of those things that make Tuck really special. Um, but of course, looking to the future, we're kind of feeling like I think much of the rest of the world, though I know, you know, there's, there's still kind of um, a lot going on around the world related to the pandemic and, and folks are really in different places right now. Um, in New Hampshire, we're feeling kind of a general sense of optimism as we think about kind of the upcoming term. Um, so with some of the good vaccination news here in New Hampshire, um, you know, really looking forward to kind of a, a more robust in-person experience for our, our incoming students, your class, Brendan. Um, so classes, you know, anticipated to be resuming um, kind of in person. Um, folks coming to campus will need to be vaccinated, though, of course, there are kind of exemptions um, for, for folks who for whom those apply. Um, but our dean has kind of shared a community message with us recently, just kind of expressing the, the optimism for the term ahead and the ability to resume some of the things that are kind of hallmarks of the tech experience. Um, even thinking about things like Tuck Go, which is our global requirement in the curriculum here at Tuck. Um, that is, you know, we're one of a handful of schools that have a global requirement in our curriculum. And it's a pretty important thing, we think, in kind of creating those wise, decisive leaders who better the world through business, um, that global kind of lens they bring. Um, so thinking about Tuck Go for the year ahead, we are kind of cautiously optimistic that we'll be able to resume some of that travel. And the Tuck Go office is, is right now in the midst of thinking about how we offer winter trips, um, GIX, uh, Global Insight Expeditions, which are kind of short topical trips led by our faculty members for our T22s, our second year students. Um, and then as we move into the spring, thinking about how we kind of extend that to your class, Brendan. So I think, you know, we're thinking in really optimistic ways at Tech right now about what's going to be possible for the fall term ahead, acknowledging that there's still a lot of logistics to be worked out, right? And um, public health guidance, as, as we know, can change day to day. So um, I think there is kind of a, a real sense that we'll be able to resume some of those hallmark um, tuck experiences. Um, but I also think, you know, we had a really robust learning environment. We had a really robust kind of co-curricular life, even with the global circumstances that were dealt this year. So I think that's really encouraging and, and kind of really showing of the tech experience, how they rose to the challenge of supporting one another, keeping our community alive, um, and even supporting the broader Upper Valley community through kind of this I'll say those uh, kind of cliche words, unprecedented times, right? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I just reiterating too, because I was part of Admitted Students Weekend and I was a part of several other online events the past uh, several months with Tuck. I, there's just a difference between some of the events I've seen run elsewhere, won't mention any names, and then the, the Tuck experience, even virtually. Um, it, the Admitted Students Weekend, I was a little nervous about because it's usually in person, now virtual. Uh, it was an amazing experience. And we have uh, group chats between all the people who went. And I mean, it's, we're building a community and we haven't even met each other yet. So um, I, 
will say that Tuck is probably one of the best suited schools to really keep that sense of community digital as well as in person. So yeah, and you know, I'll, I'll just say quickly too. I think our location plays into that too for students who are on campus. Um, you know, we have a, a pretty unique location, and um, right now I encourage you to check out virtual tours and kind of connect with students to learn a little bit more about that. But um, even through kind of the pandemic, we've been able to you know have socially distanced outdoor activities and and kind of really unique ways to keep the tech community and, and spirit alive, um, kind of tied to that location and that really immersive experience that it lends kind of the tech MBA too. Yeah, perfect. And go, so going back a little bit to the feedback, I know there's a lot of people on, may, put, that are potentially on the wait list that are that are wanting to to figure out what their next steps are. Um, another question is that uh, someone got feedback that they would that they should really improve their test scores. Um, is there another way to strengthen their application if maybe they're not able to improve that test score or potentially if they're not able to take a new test because there is always that possibility as well? Yeah, so I think to the extent that you are able to kind of prepare yourself again to take the test and, and kind of provide a new score, please do take that opportunity if that is available to you. Um, you know, we, we kind of don't send these things out into the ether just for kind of our own benefit. We do this because we really want to help you improve your candidacy and and kind of um, strengthen your application to tuck, right? Um, so if we're asking you to kind of work on, on a GMAT score or a GRE score, um, you know, take that feedback to heart. Um, oftentimes it's a great way to kind of demonstrate for us um, your academic potential, potential to kind of be successful academically in the program, quantitatively in the program, kind of you name it, there's a lot of different things that that can indicate to us. So, so take that feedback to heart. Um, if you are not able to retake the test, um, let us know why, right? Um, if we don't hear from you, uh, we might assume that you're just, you know, kind of not acknowledging or, or not responding to our feedback. So I think um, even if you are not able to improve your score per se, but we see that you're working at it, you're trying to respond to our feedback, that goes a long way, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think also kind of great to think about maybe why we asked you to take that, that GRE or that GMAT, right? Um, is it um, we wanted to see kind of greater indications of your quantitative ability? Um, might you also think about brushing up those skills or kind of taking on a stretch project at work that allows you to build that skill set? So I think kind of back to that introspective quality that we talked about before, um, respond to the specific feedback if you can, but also think about kind of you know, maybe why you're asked, you're being asked to provide that feedback and, and kind of how else you can help us get to the heart of, of kind of what we're looking to assess there. Yeah, no, that was, a, that was a, those are great points too. So yeah, I mean, of course, improving the test score, but if, if for some reason you can't uh, address why you can't and then try to understand why you're being asked and, and build upon that. Um, additionally, so I, I, we did talk about how current circumstances have kind of changed the process a little bit. And one of those was actually the the round one guaranteed interviews. So I know that, that this year uh, for my application cycle, that was kind of put in place because people weren't allowed to come uh, on campus. And for those who don't know, historically, you could go on campus and request an in-person interview um, and, and interview kind of with someone on campus. Of course, mm -hmm. with uh, the, the current situation, that wasn't um, a possibility. And uh, we got to do the round one guaranteed interview if you applied before a certain date. Is that something that Tuck, and I guess I'll, I'll put the question up, um, is that, a, is that a, I guess, a process that you're looking to keep moving forward? Or how is that going to change as, as, the, as we move on? Yeah, so this is currently kind of under review um, by the admissions committee, um, especially as kind of public health guidelines continue to evolve and change. Again, I think it's it's kind of day to day in some ways at this point, right? Um, so you can certainly bet that we will have a guaranteed interview process of some kind. What exactly that looks like for the cycle ahead, um, I cannot tell you at this exact moment, um, but we will certainly be communicating that kind of broadly um, as we move into the summer months and, and the new application is launched. Um, I think so much to think about there, right? Um, you know, certainly we we love for folks to, to be able to see our campus. Currently, Dartmouth campus remains um, closed to visitors. So you kind of need the tech ID and, and kind of testing requirements and, and all of those good things to get into a tech building. So um, as of this moment, um, that's, that's not possible for us to have folks on campus. But again, kind of things are evolving. Um, but also thinking about kind of equity and access and making sure folks all over the world um, will continue to have access in some way to a guaranteed interview with tech. Um, so that is my long way of saying, I'm not sure, Brendan, exactly what that looks like for, for the year ahead, but we will certainly be sharing a lot more details as we move into the summer um, for those planning to apply next year. Um, I think always great, though, to kind of start preparing now, right? Um, I think if you can start working your resume, if you can start thinking about kind of the application itself, start talking to your recommenders, I'm kind of getting those ducks in a row, you'll be well positioned. 
um, kind of no matter what, um, the guaranteed interview policy kind of ends up being this summer um, to submit your application early and kind of, um, as Brendan said, kind of get that out of the way and, and kind of, you know, rest a little easier knowing that that's done. And you actually bring up a great point about uh, kind of the, the round one next cycle of, of uh, applications. Um, as a fir There's a person that's asking a question. As a first-time Tuck app applicant, do you recommend they apply for round four or wait until round one? Um, are, there, are there specific candidates that maybe fare better in round four? Um, someone who's kind of stuck on the fence of maybe they want, they're really hoping to get in this year, uh, but they're just not sure if their application's ready. Kind of what are your thoughts around all of that? Yeah, I think this is such an individual decision. So would that I could, Megan Creed, an admissions officer, give you a straightforward answer here. But I think, again, kind of back to introspection, you got to think a little bit about your own circumstances, right? Um, are you going to be prepared to submit a really compelling application that does kind of you justice and highlighting kind of strengths across those four criteria right now? Um, or might a little bit more time working on a GMAT or a GRE or kind of taking on a stretch project or at work or, or thinking about a new opportunity um, provide you with some greater strength across those four criteria. Um, I don't think there's any one type of candidate that is kind of, you know, faring better per se in, in a round four. I think round four just can look different year to year. Um, so it's hard for us to say. Um, you know, of course, um, kind of dependent on, on how other rounds fare, right, um, in terms of who's enrolling at Tuck. But again, that kind of changes throughout, throughout the summer, throughout the cycle. Um, we are, again, also going back to those waitlisted applicants. So I think, you know, you won't know unless you apply, right? So if, if you think that you can do a great job of highlighting those strengths across the four application criteria right now, um, in some ways, there's no harm in applying, right? Um, we are very much reconsidering reapplicants. As I mentioned before, we're, we're very reapplicant friendly at Tuck. So if it's not a successful round four application this year, you also have the opportunity to apply again next year, right? And kind of think about um, how you continue to improve that application. Um, so I think in some ways you won't know until you try, um, but also think about kind of when your application will be at its strongest and, and kind of when the right time for you based on your personal, your professional circumstances is going to be to apply. And and I think something that also maybe doesn't get said um, at, as much as it should, uh, the application process is a very self-reflective time. Um, and a lot of times if you're trying to rush through that application to get it in, uh, you're not able to take that self-reflection and really show you, uh, so show who you are on that application. Um, I know the first couple uh, drafts I did of my essays, I would go and show it to family members or friends and they're like, that doesn't sound like you. Like I, that that sounds like some just kind of regurgitated stuff you found online. And so, so for me, it, it took time. And so there are some people that can probably build it very quickly and, and sound great and others that really need that, that time. So, so don't sell yourself short by trying to squeak in at the last, that's the last point, build the profile that's going to show who you are, especially somewhere like Tuck, uh, where I remember my, my question is how do you fit into the fabric of Tuck is, is if Tuck really is a fabric and I've, I've seen that. And so where are you going to fit? How can you help others while also kind of getting that help yourself? So. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll just add, Brendan, I think, you know, kudos to you for doing that hard work of introspection, <laughs> because I think it really serves folks well when they come into the program too. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, the folks we see really hitting the ground running when they get to Tuck are those that kind of did the hard work of introspection around their goals and how exactly they want to leverage the Tuck MBA in particular to get kind of to that place. Um, so, you know, we, we certainly ask you um, so we can get to the heart of those four admissions criteria. It's also a great exercise in thinking about kind of how you best set yourself up for success and, and kind of prepare for the MBA as well. So um, it's a really important exercise, we think, both both for the admissions process, but also kind of as you're starting on this, this two-year journey, um, that is a big investment of, of time, money, and all of those things, right? Um, kind of how do you make the most of that? We think that kind of starts with some of that introspection. Agreed. And, and an additional plug too, uh, just back to the 360 blog, uh, Tug is a very transparent uh, I, I, campus when it comes to admissions, go read the 360 blog. It provides so much information. I mean, I know when I was building out my application, I basically had dual monitors and had the 360 blog and was reading everything I could to, to fully understand. And the next question I'm going to build up is, is one of those things that you can find on the 360 blog. Um, so just another plug to, for everyone to go check it out. Um, but back on the application building process, there's always a lot of question over volunteering and, and extracurriculars and how that really affects your, your application as a whole. So maybe if you could touch a little bit on on what does volunteering in ECs do for your profile, and then maybe even touch on some of the some of the ECs that people are afraid to put on because they just don't think that they're good enough. And I know when I was going through mine, I was like, oh, I don't know if they'd really like that. And after reaching out, I was told, no, put it up, put it on. It's good to show. 
So maybe just yeah. walk us through y'all's thoughts on on extracurriculars and volunteering. Yeah, so a couple things there. I think, you know, first of all, important to remember, we don't see any part of your application in isolation, right? Um, me, Megan, Creed admissions officer, I'm not just opening kind of your extracurricular activities and making an admissions decision there, right? Um, at Tech, we have a very qualitative application review process when I kind of go in to review your application. Um, and similarly, when our TAAs do the write-ups for your interviews, we have four open text boxes that are smart, aware, accomplished, and encouraging. And I'm kind of, you know, pulling information from different facets of your application to kind of assess your alignment with those four criteria. Mm -hmm. um, so we think about volunteering and extracurriculars, you know, certainly those map to a couple different things, right? So accomplished, um, it's, it's a great way to kind of show um, beyond your kind of involvement at work, um, kind of things that you're passionate about and, and kind of how you're succeeding and contributing in those areas. Um, it can be a way to show encouraging, right? Um, so kind of sustained commitment to a cause that's important to you. It's a, a great way to show um, kind of align with that criteria. With that said, just because you volunteer, it does not make you encouraging, right? Um, it, it, it kind of um, is a place that we kind of look to see how you're involved with your community and um, kind of how, how you interface in that way. Um, but kind of uh, a commitment in that way doesn't necessarily mean you're encouraging. So we certainly look at other parts of your application to kind of get to the heart of that criteria. Mm -hmm. um, we also, again, going back to kind of, we have all of your application are looking at kind of the sum of its parts. Um, I think the question here was, you know, what if you're not able to spend time improving your extracurriculars because your job requires long hours? You tell us how much you work, right? So if we see you're working 80 hour work weeks and you're a banker and you have no time to, to kind of volunteer 20 hours a week, I get that, um, you know, I, I really do. It's kind of people on the other end of the admissions uh, process here too. Um, so again, we're kind of looking at all of that in its totality. Brennan, I think to your question of, you know, what might folks not even think to include, that, that can be really helpful. Um, if you have significant family obligations, tell us about that. Um, that's really important and that's a big part of how you spend your time, right? Um, I think about an application I read this year where someone was supporting their family business um, kind of on the side through um, kind of the pandemic and it wasn't a, an official employment activity, but it was a really important part of how they were spending their time and, and kind of um, contributing to, to their network and their community, right? Um, so I think there's a lot of activities like that um, that, you know, might not be necessarily formal in some ways, but are really important. Um, tell us how you kind of spend your time and, and what's important to you. If you have a hobby that you're really passionate about and you devote a lot of time to, um, tell us about that. That's great. Um, so again, kind of, I think to boil it down, you know, know that we review your application, kind of the sum of its parts. We're not looking at any one section in isolation. We're not looking for you to check a particular box. Um, you are kind of a unique, multifaceted human being, right? Um, so everyone's extracurricular sections are going to look different there. We're not expecting kind of a, a boilerplate set of activities. Um, we really want to see kind of what's important to you and, and how you spend your time outside of kind of your, your office or, or your work. Yeah, great, great feedback there. And um, kind of once again, still still in the building of, of a profile. There's There was another question asked, and I do want to remind everyone uh, in the chat, as we're uh, a bit past halfway, please make sure you're getting your uh, questions in the chat. I will do my best to, to throw them up. I know Alina's back there answering them as well. So we'd love to take your questions uh, while we have Megan on, on the line. Uh, but additional one that I actually do hear asked quite a bit is, how do people who maybe have less experience than than what Tuck says is their average work experience, how do they build their profile? There was a question asked uh, saying, how does Adcom um, evaluate candidates with less work experience? Maybe only two to three years, some even one. Um, are, they are they expected to create a similar magnitude of impact um, that someone who maybe has several more years? Uh, just kind of how do you look at those profiles? Yeah, sure thing. So first of all, I'll say average, right? That That is an average. Um, so it's kind of in the middle of, of where our applicants fall. So folks fall on kind of different sides of that number. Um, I think no matter kind of how much work experience you have, the important questions to answer are kind of why MBA, why tuck, and why right now? Um, why is right now kind of the right inflection point in your career to kind of be pursuing this next step? Um, and kind of how does it help you get to that next stage? And, and how does tuck specifically um, kind of serve you in that purpose. Um, I think if you can make a compelling case, um, again, no matter where you're at in your career, um, if you're kind of on the, the lower end or, or kind of, you know, have more work experience that you're bringing into the program, um, that makes a really compelling application. Um, I also think too, you know, again, we're looking for accomplishments. We're looking for you to kind of um, show your impact, to quantify your impact, to show how you've made kind of 
um, meaningful change or, or kind of lasting impact um, on your teams and your organization. Um, I often get questions, you know, I, I don't manage people yet. Um, am I at a disadvantage? No, you probably manage projects, you manage work streams, um, you have a lot of things that you do in your role. So give yourself some credit. Um, and think about how you really kind of quantify and show us all that you do in your day to day. Um, again, we acknowledge that people are kind of coming to the program at different points in their career, and that's the right time for them. And that looks different for kind of every person. So you can kind of answer those guiding questions and really help to quantify your impact. Um, I think that is a great place to start. Um, again, kind of going back to real people on the other side of the admissions table, um, we do a lot of calibrating for your industry, for your years of experience, um, for the types of teams or the work you perform. Um, we have a great admissions committee here at Tuck who have a lot of different experiences. Um, come, some come with uh, kind of higher ed backgrounds. We have folks who worked in corporate strategy. We have folks with previous consulting experience. Um, we have former investment managers. So, you know, it's a really well-rounded group who brings a lot of kind of expertise um, to kind of that calibration process as we assess across industries, across kind of different career tracks and, and paths. Fantastic. And and so building on that into to maybe the, the next step after uh, the application cycle is over, maybe you've been admitted, uh, there are questions over maybe scholarships, financial aid. Um, it, how are scholarships awarded? Is it a financial need base um, or is it for achievement awards? And uh, they were asking, who do you uh, consider as an ideal candidate for offering a scholarship? I know there are many factors, so, so maybe kind of walk me through a generalistic uh, idea. Yeah, so at Tech, we award most of our scholarship dollars kind of upfront along with your um, admissions offer. Um, but we also continue to kind of consider our available funds kind of as we move throughout the application cycle. Um, the way we think about awarding scholarships at Tuck, whether it's kind of a, you know, a more kind of formal named scholarship like a, a WIB um, or a Forte Fellow um, or a Rombo scholarship or, or something like that. Um, or kind of other, other funds is kind of alignment with our four criteria. So going back to smart, aware, accomplished, and encouraging, um, that's kind of how we think about awarding scholarships in, in many ways at Tuck is kind of alignment with those criteria um, and kind of in the aim of building the best class at Tuck, right? So a class that kind of um, brings strengths across those criteria, brings different backgrounds, um, professional, personal, um, kind of contributing to that Tuck fabric that you mentioned before, Brendan. Um, so kind of the way we, we think about awarding scholarships is, you know, trying to make it possible for as many folks um, as we can, but again, kind of trying to build that best class, um, one who will have kind of robust ideas um, to bring to the classroom, to bring to kind of co-curricular and extracurricular life at Tuck, um, and is kind of ready to engage fully with, with the program. Um, so I think kind of the best thing you can do kind of in applying to set yourself up for success um, in thinking about scholarship is really think about highlighting your strengths across those four criteria, right? Um, apply kind of um, when you feel the best about your, your test scores. Apply when you feel like your resume really does a great job of quantifying your impact. Apply when um, you kind of have done the work of introspection around that kind of singular um, story about kind of helping another person or when your recommenders are able to really give some time and attention to your um, letters of recommendation. Um, I think that is kind of one of the best things that you can do. It's just really thinking about your alignment with those four criteria and how you do your best to showcase that to the admissions committee. Great. And, and uh, this question hasn't been asked, but I know the question is usually out there. Um, but following up on that, uh, when when a scholarship is given or maybe an admission is given without a scholarship, um, how how would someone kind of uh, approach that topic with maybe Tuck admissions if if maybe they do have some financial obligations that, that a scholarship would really help with or something like that? What is the best way for them to address that? Yeah, so accessibility in the application process doesn't kind of just stop when you're admitted, right? Um, kind of as an admitted student at Tuck, um, you get a lot of different kind of points of contact here in the tech community, but you also always have an admissions officer who's kind of um, giving you access to their calendar and is kind of ready to really kind of help you get connected to the right resources and, and kind of help you understand um, what's possible for you at Tuck as you kind of are making your decision. Um, so I think be in touch with us um, is, is kind of the best thing you can do if, if you're feeling kind of doubts or, or concerns around your financing. Um, our financial aid team is a wonderful group of women who have literally decades of experience at Tuck. They are super accessible. Um, I like to think I'm a pretty accessible, approachable person too, and, and I'd extend that to my colleagues. Um, I think, you know, pick up the phone, send an email, reach out to us. Um, let's talk about kind of where you're at and, and some of your concerns, and, and we can kind of go from there. Um, you know, we, we certainly can't kind of um, 
promise that there will be additional funds to that will be available to you, um, you know, when or if that will happen. Um, but we can always kind of help you connect to the resources as best we can um, and kind of help you think through that decision process. Fantastic. And and maybe more on a, a as a general question, um, I know Tuck's alumni network is, is, is spoken about around the world. It's, it's one of kind of Tuck's uh, uh, the biggest trophies, if you will. Everyone knows when they go to Tuck, they're getting this alum, uh, alumni network. That's just insane. Could you explain to people that maybe don't understand how a, a school that has such a low amount of students and uh, when compared to some of these other universities, why is their alumni work so strong and so amazing, uh, maybe comparative to some of those schools who just have 1,500 people per class? Because wouldn't that just mean that they have more people to network with? So uh, maybe yeah. maybe help people understand that. Yeah, Brian, I might ask you to weigh in with your experience kind of connecting with alums, but I think there's a, a couple things that kind of play into that. You know, the Tuck MBA is, is such a unique one, right? We're located in the small town of New Hampshire. Our student board president, Teo, always likes to refer to it as a 24-7 MBA experience, and I think that's right. You know, at, at Tuck, you don't kind of get to pack up and go back into the city and kind of hide away at the end of the day. Um, you know, you're living beside the folks you're in class with, you're um, kind of dining with them in, in Burn Dining Hall, you're kind of attending the same events with them on a Saturday at night or, or seeing them at Murphy's. Um, you kind of have this really immersive sense of community and also of place. Um, and kind of that, that focus on the MBA, the small scale really means there's a lot of kind of connectivity that happens in the program. It's super immersive um, and that kind of stays with folks for a lifetime. Um, but I think that kind of creates this um, really unique experience that transcends class years, right? Um, so if you talk to a T85, um, I know I saw an alumni chat with, um, I think it was a T82 maybe the other day, um, their experience in some ways, you have commonalities with them, right? So it's really easy to connect with folks across class years and, and a lot of folks really continue to identify with this really unique two-year period in their lives. Um, you know, you hear all the time from Tuckies who, are coming back formally to Tuck to recruit, but also who have maybe a second home or make a, a kind of annual pilgrimage to the Upper Valley because they have such a connection to um, kind of those two years. So I think it mm -hmm. creates this really kind of small but mighty community. Um, Tuckies are among the most engaged alums out there, and there's a lot of different ways to measure that. Um, you know, certainly annual giving, we kind of um, blow some of our peer schools out of the water there. But I think more compelling is how giving they are of their time um, to kind of future generations of Tuckies. There's this real kind of culture of paying it forward, I think. Um, and, you know, that kind of is carried on as a tradition year to year at Tuck. Um, huge culture of mentorship within the student body. So thinking about things like the consulting club or second year students kind of on a volunteer basis spend dozens of hours um, kind of um, walking first year students through case cases to prepare them for interviews um, to alums who kind of are willing to kind of pick up the, the phone at the drop of a hat. Um, I always love to tell the story of one of our alums, Leslie, who, who now is based in Seattle, but um, she told me this great story of when she um, had a job in Nashville. She showed up in Nashville not really knowing anyone. Within a week of being there, um, somehow one Tucky in the area had heard that she had moved to the area, sent her an email. Um, it was like, you're coming over to dinner at my house on Thursday. Every Tuck alumni um, alum in the, the Nashville area will be there. She showed up on Thursday. 17 Tuckies were there, super excited to welcome her to the Nashville community, share their networks, kind of get her and her family set up. And I think that's just such a great indication of kind of no matter where you are, whether you're in, you know, a Boston or New York or a San Francisco where you might find a lot of Tuckies or a Nashville, right? Um, you'll kind of find this really small but incredible community of folks who are kind of bonded around this common experience and kind of this culture of, of paying things forward. Mm -hmm. And I'm, and I think it it also extends to the career centers uh, as well. Uh, I know when I was admitted um, and I, I got the call, I was I was over. The, of course, I mean you wait for that call, you wait and wait, and finally it comes. And I was over the moon there. Uh, but then within 24 hours, I had three or four different alumni, um, uh, Tuck alumni in the industry that I'm trying to go into, all message me and say, "Hey, congratulations on on getting admitted. Uh, career Services just reached out and said that you got admitted, and I would love to touch base. Let's talk." about maybe what you want to do at Tuck and, and I'll tell you about my experience. And, and that age range was, was pretty uh, steep. I, I want to go into consulting. I talked to a partner at one of the consulting firms that I really want to go to, um, as well as someone who graduated a year ago. Um, and then they even set me up, of course, with the, the, the kind of a mentor, if you will, in the Tuck area as well. So it really just extends to the Tuck culture of kind of giving and helping each other as you, as you go along. And I think that that just 
kind of continues. Uh, I don't think Tuck brings people to the campus that they think wouldn't uh, continue to do that. And I think uh, that's why we are, that the alumni is as strong as it is. Uh, I, yeah. Brennan, I think, I think that's a great point, right? Um, I, I think there's this great phrase that kind of um, really resonates for me when I think about Tuck and it's kind of all ships rise with the tide, right? You know, certainly you're working on your kind of individual success and recruiting and all of those things at Tuck, but there's also kind of, I think, this sense of collective success and, and kind of really rooting for one another and kind of tying it back to kind of why we're here talking about the admissions process. I think that really starts at the admissions process, right? One of our things we look for at Tuck is encouraging. Um, you know, we want folks who are collaborative, who are empathetic, who um, kind of are willing to be part of this unique culture where folks really do support one another, um, which is why it's kind of one of those four words that we kind of um, hold at the center of our process. Yeah, no, and that's and that's that's what I'm hoping everyone else gets to experience. And um, if if there's any if there's anyone on the line that needs convincing that that Tuck is um, everything that it's talked up to be, I guarantee you that it's not talked up enough. Uh, that was that was one of my things. Is I heard all of this this great praise about Tuck, and I was like, oh man, I hope it hope it lives up to it. If anything, it was still understated. Um, so. So if anyone's on the fence, just message me and I'll I'll be your uh, promoter. Uh, but I do see another question that popped up uh, from Zachary as well. And he was asking about um, joint degrees um, or concurrent degrees, students who maybe have multiple years, i.e. like a three-year program. Um, is there, there we go, is there a co co cohort of folks who progress together in these programs? Yeah, sure. So um, it's a smaller number of folks who pursue joint degrees at Tuck each year, so it's not kind of a huge portion of the class. Um, for any of our joint or concurrent programs, though, we do require you to complete your full kind of core um, curriculum year with kind of the same class, right? So you're not kind of spreading that across multiple years. Um, for many of our programs that are kind of three-year, um, you're spending kind of your, your core year with us at Tuck, maybe a core year in the, the kind of partner program, um, and then you're kind of splitting your time to kind of round out your degree. Um, but we think it's really important for you to ground yourself in the tech community kind of by spending a full year in the core curriculum with us. That's important mm -hmm. from kind of a learning standpoint, but also for kind of um, understanding the resources available to you, kind of integrating with, with the tech culture. Um, so I think that's really important. The other thing that I'll say too, you know, in a small place like Tuck, um, you get to be pretty close with the class both ahead of you and behind you anyhow, right? So um, we have a lot of community events where folks are kind of um, mingling across classes. We have a lot of mentorship that happens between classes. Those kind of connections form really organically. Um, so I think, you know, even if um, you're kind of splitting across class years, you really get the opportunity to kind of be close not only with your cohort right in that core year, but also kind of the, the cohorts ahead of and behind you. So um, lots of kind of individualized support from the MBA program office, from different offices at Tuck, I know career services especially, um, work closely with those folks as they think about kind of where the, the internship um, kind of fits in with their experience. Um, but kind of, I think, again, at a place like Tuck, you, you really kind of get to know people um, kind of even beyond your class year. I'll send that to faculty and staff, too. Um, I always love going to a Tuck Talks or something like that and seeing a professor in the front row cheering folks on. Um, I think that's the type of community we are. And, and you really kind of get the chance to, to know people, form those bonds. Um, and they happen so organically because we're kind of in this unique sense of place um, where folks have to create community for one another. Mm -hmm. No, that's and that's a that's a great that's a great caveat. I mean, the Tuck experience is just uh, I, I'm I'm over the moon for it. So I I know uh, that there are a lot of people that are kind of just in that waiting period right now, potentially on a wait list, potentially waiting to apply for next year, and just uh, just kind of maybe confused at what to do next. So maybe just uh, wrap us all up and give your thoughts on what does the landscape look like in the future? What does the landscape look like right now? What should people do who are maybe just a little nervous about the process? Um, maybe just uh, as we, as we kind of close out some last minute advice to people who are kind of, uh, kind of stuck in the middle of the process and are maybe feeling a little down on themselves. Yeah. So first of all, I'll say, I'll, I'll go back to take a deep breath, right? Um, kind of we're you know, it's, it's an important part of kind of thinking about your future, but kind of take your take a deep breath, give yourself a break, um, kind of, you know, self-care a little bit. Um, second, acknowledge that you are great, right? You have strengths across those four criteria um, and kind of be confident in those strengths. Um, and, and kind of to Brendan's earlier point too, um, think about kind of how important that introspection is not only to your application process, um, but also to um, kind of your success in the MBA, no matter where you are at in the application process, whether you're preparing an application for round four or next year, whether you're thinking about your waitlist status and how to improve your candidacy, 
um, whether you were unfortunately denied this year and are, are planning to reapply next year, um, do some introspection, kind of assess your alignment with those four criteria um, and kind of how you can continue to improve your strengths across those criteria. Um, and then I'll finally just say, connect with us. Um, again, we, we really pride ourselves on being accessible, transparent. It's one of my favorite things about working for Tuck Admissions. I always like to share the story of um, kind of my interview day at Tuck um, a few years ago when I was kind of coming into the community. Um, I've worked other places where you kind of can't walk down a hall to talk to an admissions officer. And my first day at Tuck, the thing that struck me is you can wander right by the waiting room and, and kind of knock at my door as Megan Creed, an admissions officer. Um, a little different right now where I'm not in my office, um, but I think that virtually remains true, right? Reach out to me, reach out to my colleagues at Tuck Admissions, um, read the Tuck360 blog, connect with us at online events, um, reach out to Tuck Ambassadors. I know we'll count Brendan among their rank um, not too long from now, um, but connect with the community, connect with us, let us know how we can help. Um, we're always super happy to hear from you. Beautiful. Yeah. And, and once again, to everyone watching, uh, this is posted on YouTube. You can go back. Um, I definitely suggest uh, kind of listening to Megan's first five or six minutes. Um, she gave a great overview, uh, listening to some of the questions again, um, but then also just listening to the resources you have available. Definitely the 360 blog. If you're someone that is kind of confused at where to start in your application, the 360 blog is such a good resource. It's a very transparent look at what Tuck actually looks for. Um, and, and please, when you're reading that, just know that that is that is fully true. I mean, if you're reading it on that 360 blog, that is 100% what they are using um, kind of as a criteria when looking at applications. It's what I based my application off really. And I, I guess it worked well enough. Um, so uh, thank you again, Megan. Um, oh, and we did have actually one more question pop up that I did want to uh, get out there and we'll take this as the last question. Uh, and that's from Karthik asking a little bit about uh, the career side, uh, which I know once again, you can always feel free to reach out to the career services as well. Uh, but they were asking, um, how many companies actually sponsor visas for in international students? And it says for consulting, but maybe just overall, what does the landscape look like for international students potentially trying to get a visa? Yeah, so I don't have kind of a concrete number to, to share with you, Karthik, but um, I think this is kind of one of the places that I always like to go back to the small size of Tuck and, and how that's such an asset for our students. So, you know, at Tuck, you're not a student ID number. You really are going to kind of get to know people at a pretty kind of close and personal level, and, and that includes our career services advisors. So career services at Tuck is a team of phenomenal human beings um, who also happen to be kind of industry experts. Um, you know, they come from great companies. Many, if not, I think most of them now are Tuckies. Um, they just have such a kind of wealth of knowledge and, and industry connection. Um, and I, I bring this up because they really work with you on a pretty individualized basis throughout your career journey. Um, Brendan, for you, starting even kind of the summer before you enroll, um, you'll be hearing from career services to talk about your resume, to talk about kind of how to set yourself up for recruiting when you come into the program. Um, they will find you if you don't find them as a student, right? Um, so you kind of get to work with them on a pretty individualized basis around your specific circumstances when it comes to career, right? Whether that's you're an international student and you'd like to find a company to sponsor you here, um, whether that's you're returning to your home country and you have a, a kind of more network job search, or maybe you have an industry um, that doesn't recruit on campus, you're kind of doing a bit more of a network job search anyhow, um, they are really able to support you on a pretty individualized basis, um, kind of due to that small cohort size. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's pretty powerful. I'll also just put out a, a kind of shout out to Matias Machado, who is a Tuck alum, a member of the career services team, um, who works specifically with our international students to kind of think about what opportunities might set them up for success, both for their career goals um, and, and kind of for some of their ambitions for maybe remaining in the U.S. So, um, it's my long-winded way of saying kind of the small cohort size, kind of individualized support that you get, I think really helps kind of channel you to the right opportunities, um, whether you're a domestic student or you're an international student, kind of based on what you're looking for there. Mm -hmm. And then once again, another shout out to the Tuck Ambassadors too. I mean, uh, you can reach out to current international students and see what they're seeing in the job market as they're applying and um, and, and hear directly from them as well. So um, I think it, it has, um, it, it's definitely been stated a lot and it will continue to be. Tuck has so many resources. Uh, you just need to take the time to actually start to explore them. Um, but I think uh, we're coming up on time. So I do want to thank you, Megan. It was a great conversation, um, especially just uh, helping build, I guess, my excitement still uh, for a couple months away when I'll be joining. Um, but I know we got uh, to a lot of different questions today and hopefully uh, we hit most of them. Um, but I think if, uh, and Megan would agree, if you 
had a question that didn't get answered or you didn't want to answer it on the platform, please reach out to Tuck, whether it's the uh, admissions team, um, the alumni network, or uh, the ambassadors, there will be someone that can help you. And if I guarantee you, if they don't know the answer, they will put you in the right direction. So thank you so much, Megan. Thank you, Brendan. Can't wait to see you in the fall. And, and thanks to everyone for joining. It was really great to, to kind of chat for this hour. Of course. Okay. Bye, everyone.